Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to California Dreamin', How Do Social Movements Reimagine California? I'm Julie Fry, President and CEO of California Humanities, and we're really glad to have you here today. California Humanities has been around for about 45 years, and we're an independent nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we focus on connecting the people of California through the public humanities by making grants and delivering programs across the state that help us learn together about our histories, cultures, and experiences. California on the Ballot, of which this event is part of, is a series of virtual events focused on issues of electoral engagement in California that we'll be producing through April of this year. It's supported by the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So we are very grateful to them for making this happen. So before we get started, I have one piece of housekeeping. Uh, the chat room is your space to connect with each other and to join the conversation. We ask that you write questions for Dr. Blancet and Dr. Deverell into the Q&A section. We'll take audience questions as we go and then reserve 10 minutes at the end for any questions from you that we may have missed. And now I would like to welcome both of our speakers. And I'll start by introducing Dr. William Deverell, an American historian who focuses on the 19th and 20th century American West. He's written works on political, social, ethnic, and environmental history. He's currently working on a book exploring the post-Civil War American West, forthcoming from Bloomsbury. With David Igler, he's co-editing the Encyclopedia of California for UC Press. Dr. Deverell directs the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, and he's also spent a lot of time being a California Humanities Board member and a really great partner. So glad you're both here. Over to you, Bill. What's California look like before Richard Oaks, before Alcatraz, in terms of indigenous, indigenous activism? That's a fabulous question. And you know, I, I think um, I'll, I'll try to do it as, as good a justice as I can. I did more um, a 1960s uh, historian than a 1860s or earlier, but, you know, indigenous peoples throughout California um, have always been actively resisting, uh, whether it be uh, the Russians coming in uh, from the north um, and establishing a fort, uh, but which primarily was, was based strictly on trade, uh, to whether it was Father Serra and the establishment of missions um, early on in, in Spanish territory, um, moving north in their frontier. Um, Native peoples have always actively resisted and tried to maintain strong cultural ties. Uh, the hard part about those early inferences of, of Russian and Spanish empires um, is the overlay of disease that was brought by both empires that really decimated a lot of uh, the population that didn't have a lot of the immunities to disease. And in addition to that was taking advantage of, of, of indigenous generosity um, and commitment uh, to honoring these, these new um, you know, trading relationships with Spain. Uh, the mission system in and of itself became an, a very oppressive system um, in which numerous indigenous peoples would lose their lives. And through that depopulation, we then had um, a call by 1840s for a gold rush, right, that uh, brought and triggered people from around the world um, into California. And of course, that gold rush um, triggered a, a, an intense um, violence that followed it, uh, which was to see the, the full scale extermination and genocide of indigenous peoples throughout California as Ben Madley's book really a, a test for. And I'd highly recommend uh, checking out his book, American Genocide. Um, a, 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 a portion of which when the United States government would eventually um, annex and or bring in California as a state by 1850, um, a good part of that genocide was already um, occurring um, and it would continue moving forward. But they would deny rights to indigenous peoples for voting. They would deny um, uh, indigenous peoples the chance to organize. Um, treaties were not necessarily um, established with many of the native nations throughout California. And like the Pitt River Nation I found in my own research, held 3.5 million acres of, of land um, that they never ceded to the federal government, just like the Lakota never seceded in giving the Black Hills away, their sacred lands. They tried to purchase those later, 
uh, but they never uh, ceded those through treaty. And because of that, this would be an ongoing legacy um, in the sense of securing indigenous rights. All of this would feed in. Um, to the securing of uh, indigenous rights. And then by the 1870s, we have the ghost dance and the ghost dance movement was very prevalent in the 1870s throughout all of California um, in which we saw active resistance. We have, saw active organiz organizing uh, collectively and, and the ghost dance essentially was a, a revival movement. It was a, a movement in understanding what had happened um, due to genocide, due to environmental ecocide that was uh, rampant throughout uh, California in the sense of the gold rush and hydraulic mining and all the, the various uh, techniques that ravaged the land. Um, this was a movement to, to recenter us, to, to bring us together, uh, to start a new, a new kind of California dreaming, if you will, um, that would uh, be able to see a future in which indigenous peoples would one, um, still be able to organize, still be able to speak our, our language, uh, still be able to give life to our people and practice our traditions and ceremonies. So uh, it was a movement that was also misconstrued. It would lead up to the massacre of Wounded Knee in 1890 um, as that transitioned into the 1890 ghost dance. Uh, but it really started in California. And of course, by you know the 20th century, we had the Mission Indian Federation. We had uh, California Native peoples organizing and creating intertribal organizations um, well before uh, the 1920s in order to basically secure greater land rights and also greater freedoms and to protest for the right to be able to vote even within the state of California as these things wouldn't really happen until the World War II era um, in yeah, states yeah. like Arizona and New Mexico. It's amazing, you know, just to think about the, the various ways in which we can, I don't know, create themes and of understanding about indigenous America or indigenous California in this case for tonight. Uh, one theme is survival, right? I mean, the, the insults and assaults and trauma and violence and immunological disaster and cultural theft, et cetera. The, the survival itself seems noteworthy and astonishing and remarkable because of course, Many from the dominant society assumed that uh, indigenous survival was not not to be. Um, and so there's that. But then, as you point out, and with a California sensibility, it's not simply that. It's it's cultural maintenance. It's cultural vitality. It's uh, advocacy and activism as well. So um, you know, part of the same story because the survival has to take place for all that other activity to be um, viable. But it is really a remarkable, and remarkably early, I think, the way you just characterized it, 1870s, 1890s, 19 teens, uh, coming together. So I guess, well, let me see if you agree with that. I do, and I, I think, you know, part of it is, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, uh, you know, uh, for, for my people, we went through the, the Trail of Tears, uh, which we would lose half of our, our people, you know, in this arduous, you know, uh, bayonets at our back walk and force march uh, from our homelands to, to Oklahoma. Um, and, you know, the idea of this was that, you know, it's not something of which victimized. Um, it was something that we gathered strength from because we understood that we were at this impasse. We understood that we were at this part where we had to come together um, if we were going to be able to survive. And it's a story of overcoming insurmountable odds. Um, and quintessentially, it, it's one of those stories that, you know, depending on the lens you want to view it from, um, it's a lens that can empower and it's, it's a, or it's a lens that can victimize or continue to traumatize. And so history is really fraught with uh, these issues in which, especially in indigenous history, we have to then uh, be able to say, where do we find our empowerment uh, within these stories and where do we center that empowerment? Um, and I think within the California story, um, you know, we begin to see that uh, those heroes and those, those leaders and those warriors uh, that sacrificed everything for their people give us an example of true American heroism um, in regards to sacrificing everything to preserve a future destiny for their peoples. Yeah, and I, I, I can sense that um, finding and telling and interpreting and offering those stories is precisely one of the strongest motivations for you as a scholar and a writer. Um, is there a hint here that the, let's, let's say the red power movement and uh, activism is, uh, you know, we, we've got a particular period in which we place it, which is with 
your book, really, and your your era. But Red Power has been around a long time, right? Of course, uh, you know, and you know, I had somebody once tell me, you know, hey man, we've we've had Red Power since 1492, and you know, and that's that's true. But what I try to do with the book is try to look at something different um, in the sense of trying to define what Red Power is and how do we, you know, uh, differentiate that from native nationalism. And it seems to be, you know, a lot of the movements that we had before, while there's an intertribal component to like the ghost dance, um, many of the ghost dance itself was, was about native nationalism, essentially. I mean, granted we were coming together and we were sharing resources, but it was uh, that revitalization movement centered upon Native nations um, actively pursuing um, the protection of their sovereignty um, and furthering uh, their rights as a nation. And by the time we get to you know, the World War II era, especially in the 1960s, um, it, Alcatraz would symbolize a new kind of beginning in indigenous politic and modern organizing, uh, which was an intertribal movement, in which Native peoples were coming together um, and they were still talking about ideas of, of native land liberation. They were still talking about ideas of how do we, at the same point in time, indigenize the space around us um, in order to create a better future for, for our children. Um, and some of that indigenizing of space meant how do we transform space, right? How do we build Indian centers to overcome destructive federal policies like relocation and like termination? How do we build institutions like Native American studies at, at San Francisco State or at UCLA and Berkeley in order to basically educate a whole new generation in, in Native rights and sovereignty? So Red Power accomplishes this kind of building initiative, this, this kind of intertribal coming together and organizing um, that was really unique to its time period that has lasting reverberations on up even into uh, 2016 when we begin to watch Standing Rock unfold on our news um, stations and, and seeing people stand up and coming from hundreds of miles away to lend their support um, and 10,000 people strong um, at that occupation. So really red power, I guess if I were to differentiate it, um, yes, we've always had it um, because it's always been a component of native nationalism. But what we see is that it, it separates from native nationalism into some, a new kind of movement by the time we get to the 1960s. So I'm fascinated by this comment uh, about indigenizing space um, and what that means, you know, how do you do that? Um, so in, in addressing that and um, tugging at these fascinating things you're talking about. Can you set the stage for us about your book, uh, how you begin the book, but also how you contextualize this moment or movement coming out of post-World War II, the rise of the civil rights movement, uh, a centering of certain activism, certainly in California, um, of various groups seeking redress um, and repair. So give us a sense of, before we indigenize it in full, give us a sense of the context and the arrival of this sensibility in California that you pick up and go ahead and feel free to introduce Richard Oakes. Yeah, nice, uh, yeah. You know, it, it, it starts with San Francisco, um, you know, and, and that's where Red Power's origins have an urban design. Um, and, and, and that urban design is not without a connection to reservation spaces as well. Um, in, in the sense of the, the philosophy, the ideology of this movement. And San Francisco has a very long trajectory. I mean, stretching all the way back to the outing systems, you know, in which the boarding schools throughout California, uh, like Sherman, uh, would send native students to work um, in San Francisco, oftentimes um, in domestic service positions or um, uh, other work situations in the sense of farming or laboring um, throughout the city. And people stayed. Um, and, you know, San Francisco is an indigenous city. Um, it's built upon Olane as well as Miwok lands. Uh, so it's one of those things that, you know, San Francisco, uh, since its inception, it was, in, it was conceived by um, indigenous peoples um, as, as a, a, an important sacred space uh, for the Olane people, like Alcatraz Island was. So um, indigenous peoples have always been here. You know, we have uh, vestiges of where memorializations have oftentimes left indigenous peoples out over the century. Um, you know, we have uh, Mission Dolores, you know, the remaining architects and, uh, of, of the mission system um, that are still uh, with us to this day. 
but San Francisco also started to get a, a boost by the time we get to the 1940s, uh, more particularly in the native population, um, primarily because of relocation. And relocation was a program uh, that would start in the late 1940s um, as an experiment on Hopi and Navajo peoples. Um, the government at this point in time was, was eagerly thinking of ways in which they could detribalize native peoples, they could de disenfranchise us, um, and all in the guise that they would be giving us some sort of benefit by moving us to a city. So they devised this program called Relocation. It was headed by Dylan Meyer, um, in which Dylan Meyer happened to be the architect of the War Relocation Authority that um, had removed thousands of Japanese Americans from San Francisco um, to be interred in, in camps in far out desolate places um, because they were seen as a fifth column or a threat to uh, the potential of the America's war effort. Now, what's fascinating is at the time that they're moving Japanese Americans out, they're moving American Indians in. Um, and it's the same person that becomes the architect <laughs> for this relocation program um, in the, under the Bureau of Indian Affairs during the Eisenhower administration. And ironically, the vice president under Eisenhower is Richard Nixon, uh, who is a, one of the more famous of California politicians at the time. Um, so Nixon would have to make up for this um, issue. Um, one in seven native peoples will go on relocation to uh, one of six cities, San Francisco being one of them. Uh, we were meant to be given a one-way bus ticket. And when we got off of the bus, that's when the government services stopped. Although the promises were that they would find us jobs, they would find employment, they would find us a place to live, they would find us a furniture allowance as well, um, sometimes even training for jobs. And most of the time what we found is that this was just a dead end of broken promises. It was just another treaty. So out of this, Native peoples began organizing in San Francisco and um, eventually they started pulling together resources uh, by the mid 1960s uh, to create an Indian center um, in which they were able to kind of bring in this larger component of, of the native population, which at the time of the 1960s was around 30,000 people um, in San Francisco. And by the 1970s, it would shoot up to an upwards of 40,000 40, people um, within San Francisco proper. And of course, there was other cities like Denver, Los Angeles. Um, there was uh, oh, Cleveland, Ohio. It was one of those cities that was receiving relocatees as well. Um, and because of this, it meant there was this kind of intellectual drain that was happening on, on reservations across the United States. It was, it was very much a voluntary system. And a lot of people thought, hey, you know, we have the chance of a, a dual income. We have the chance that our kids going to a, a nice public school as well. Um, and sure, they, 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 you know, were hooked by the carrot uh, by the BIA. But the problem was, because there's no jobs, because there was a, a no assistance whatsoever, a lot of people wound up in the mission district. And a lot of people wound up trying to find jobs and just trying to eke out a living. Um, it was very desperate times. And without the Indian Center, without Native peoples coming together to support one another, many people would have had to return back home um, and destitute and even more broke. Uh, than when they arrived. So this, this was a really important transitionary period. And this was coupled by another intense program called Termination in 1953, which was really felt uh, in a heavy way by Native peoples throughout California, uh, as over 109 Native nations were legislatively eradicated from 1953 all the way up until 1970. And so what this does is it sets the tone uh, for uh, new people to emerge in the sense of leadership positions. Uh, Rupert Costo and Janetta Henry would found the American Indian Historical Society and they begin publishing the very first ever uh, native journal um, and newsletter called the Indian Historian, um, which was to really showcase the fact that indigenous studies and uh, or indigenous discourses in academe had a place um, uh, before this time, it didn't exist. Um, and it wouldn't be until the late 1960s that a, a mass movement would come together in order to usher in Native American studies that would legitimize that um, movement for indigenous studies. And along the way, before this, this happened, a young man who grew up at least in Aquasasne, who was not from California, um, he was Mohawk from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, grew up in um, Aquasasne, which was 
straddled the border between Canada and the United States. He was a former high steel worker uh, written by the name of Richard Oakes. Um, and in working high steel in New York, um, he was uh, understood leadership. He understood organization. He understood teamwork. He understood what it took also to work 60 stories above uh, the earth without a harness um, and knowing that your life could be taken at any moment. Um, so he had a fearlessness about him. So speaking to reporters was not gonna be a problem uh, for Richard Oates. He was gonna have a very strong voice. Um, and pretty soon Richard decided like many of his generation in the 1960s that really the rest of the world was going to be defined by what was happening in California at the time. That California was ahead of the curve. Um, it was this new place, this place that was open uh, to people of color, supposedly, uh, that it was open in the sense of ideas, that it was experimental. It was the summer of love. It was a time period in which you had one city um, uh, that was welcoming love while the rest of America was watching hate in the sense of unfolding in the civil rights movement in the South, or people basically um, uh, being carted off to Vietnam only to be brought back in boxes. And this was a, a situation in which people were hitting the streets and it was no different in San Francisco, but San Francisco was the hotbed of organizing. It was a hotbed of radicalism. And Richard Oakes seemed to want to be a part of all of that. Like many Americans, he made the great trip west um, in a new westward migration to find freedom in a city called San Francisco. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, and this is, the, he comes in 65, 66? So he comes in uh, what I believe is uh, 68. Um, okay. He actually meets his wife, um, who's Annie Oaks, uh, who's Kashaya Pomo, um, from uh, which the reservation of Stewart's Point Rancheria is just north of San Francisco. They meet at an anti-war rally um, and they fall, fall in love. And she had several kids from a previous marriage, uh, which Richard just adopted as his own kids uh, right away. He always wanted to be a dad. Um, and so he jumped at the opportunity and those kids would receive uh, tutoring, ironically, in the uh, upper story of the Indian Center, um, in which Richard Oak's first job was working in the Indian bar, uh, known as Warren Slaughterhouse Bar, which was about two storefronts down off of 16th Street in the Mission District uh, from the Indian Center, uh, which was a rough and tumble bar. I think Dean Chavers, who's Lumby, uh, who is one of the mainland coordinators for the Alcatraz occupation, described it as one of the, the grungiest and dirtiest bars he'd ever seen and barely even wanted to set foot in it uh, because it was so rough and tumble. Yeah. Uh, but Richard could hold his own in, in that place. And uh, interesting enough, it was the same place that uh, Russell Means, uh, who's another S San Franciscan uh, through relocation, Russell Means had basically said that was the first place at Warren's Bar that he'd ever heard about termination. So in other words, people were talking about politics. Politics, yeah, exactly. So um, I, I'm going to turn your slides over to you in a second, Kent, and Renee can help us move through them to narrate this picture and this story. Just a, a question or two before we do so. Um, relocation, what's the gender breakdown between the natives who come to the cities? So we, we don't really have the gender no, breakdown in the sense of how many peoples that were coming in via men and women, but we know it's one in seven or a hundred thousand native people in general. Um, part of this is because a lot of people that were individuals could come on relocation. I think a majority happened to be men. Uh, primarily, uh, they were veterans from the war um, that would go on relocation uh, pretty readily, and sometimes they would send for their families. Um, but oftentimes it was women too. Um, Lenata Means, uh, who was one of the, the leaders of the Alcatraz movement, came from Fort Hall uh, Reservation and, and decided to uh, come to San Francisco on relocation. Another person I interviewed was Mary Lee Johns, who came here at a very young age from Cheyenne River. Um, and so many women uh, were also taking part in this. And you, you got to understand that, especially for Native women, this meant an opportunity. Um, and oftentimes the, coming from very patrilineal places where you weren't able to get jobs sometimes, um, only men were able to get those jobs. Uh, this meant for newfound freedoms and native liberation for women um, in the sense of being able to have an income and a career um, outside of that uh, places where sometimes you're, you're experiencing 80% unemployment and no jobs were going to women. Uh, this meant a, a, a massive change in standard of life uh, for yeah. People. It's just a you know proof again that um, the California dream is 
capacious. You know, it can it can absorb hopes and wishes um, beyond just the conventional kind of gold rush dreaming uh, that we tend to caricature. The California dream can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, Kent, do you want to take us um, through the the imagery of the book and narrate uh, some of those amazing photographs you've got? Let's let's start with this. Yeah, this this is uh, the newsletter. Um, this is volume one, number one of the Indians of All Tribes newsletter. Indians of All Tribes was the organization that was created by a conglomeration of students uh, from San Francisco State and UC Berkeley that came together um, to take over Alcatraz Island in 1969. Um, you want to and, just set the stage, uh, sorry, Kent, to interrupt, but set the stage for the takeover. What happens? Great. Yeah, no, it, it's an exciting story. It has to be told. Uh, so um, early in November is, is when kind of the, the D-Day was going to occur. And um, this this early test case, there was there was three attempts. And the, the first attempt was really a scouting mission. Um, they go down to the pier and they go down to the dock. And this is really great street theater. Um, Indians of all tribes and the students between Richard Oaks, Lenata Means, the students at Berkeley, students at San Francisco State, they'd come together and they wrote a collective document uh, called a proclamation. Um, and this proclamation was also, um, at least input was given from uh, other native peoples and other native organizations throughout California as well. And they get down to the pier, They're, Richard Oaks actually takes out um, strips of cloth and strips of beads in one hand, mimicking uh, the purchase, at least of Manhattan Island some 300 years ago, and offers to buy Alcatraz Island, a place that had been decommissioned um, in 1963 uh, by the federal government is no longer being a prison, so it's set vacant. So he's offering to buy this vacated federal property uh, from the government. And the reporters are going nuts. They're loving it. He reads the proclamation. The problem is they don't have a boat. Um, so they, they go up and down and they finally find this guy, Ronald Craig, who kind of looks like Austin Powers in a, a crushed blue, you know, leisure suit, you know, has the sword. And he's, he's on this boat, which was Captain, the recommissioned ship for Canada, celebrating James Cook's expeditions, who was kind of like the Columbus of the Pacific in a weird way. Um, so in other words, they have a, a, the, this, this boat, which is um, recasted after his, his uh, boat, the, uh, the Discovery or the Endeavor, and so they, in a weird way, indigenize, they claim this boat because Ronald Craig is like, you got all these reporters, this is great for me. I'll take you around the island, but I, I can't land on the island because if I land, my boat might be confiscated. So they pull out, um, Craig literally fires the cannons off and the students go nuts, the reporters are going nuts. And, you know, as the boat starts to go up and around the island, um, it's not gonna be enough for Richard Oakes. Richard goes to the front of the boat he takes his shirt off, he's wearing his jeans and cowboy boots, and he jumps in uh, to the ocean and he begins swimming over 250 yards uh, to get to the island. And pretty soon four more individuals jump in. Um, and this is really provocative because, you know, the bay waters differ one degree in temperature year round. Most people have to wear, you know, dry suits to be able to swim that. Um, the undertow is e e e excruciating. Um, you know, there's a reason they built the federal prison that you're not supposed to swim to it. You're not supposed to swim away from it. Richard Oakes defies where the boat won't take him. He becomes the inaction example, the symbol of self-determination. In other words, where the boat won't take us, we'll power ourselves to take us there. And he claims the island. Now it doesn't last very long. He's taken off the island. And the next night the students go on a scouting mission. They literally play cat and mouse with uh, people on the island as far as the, the few security guards. And they're captured the next day and they give themselves up because they literally had one loaf of bread and a couple of sleeping rolls because they wanted to see what are the resources there for a longer, long-term occupation? And after this, Richard then feels like, hey, we have the momentum, we can do this. And he goes to San Jose State, he goes to UCLA, he starts traveling in this college campus tour and begins recruiting native students from all the college campuses in California for the D-Day invasion, which was November 20th, 1969. And they do it at night and they do it by way of the Sausalito Navy across the way um, in San Francisco. And they come in at two, three in the morning, landing over 80 people on Alcatraz Island. And the next morning, it is hitting world papers from Germany to Japan to England, even in the United States, front page news. And Nixon is, is beside himself on what to do um, to set up the scenario or the scene on um, the takeover of Alcatraz, an, an occupation that will last 
another 19 months, um, all the way up until June of 1971. So, so let's, let's move, let's move uh, Renee, we can see the next slide, please. So this is Richard reading the proclamation on Alcatraz Island. Um, you know, that last slide of, of the newsletter is also important because the students were highly organized. They, they didn't just come to the island to stage a protest. They came to show how to develop a, a liberated indigenous community, that the only free land um, in native North America was, was a former prison. Um, that they, they used it as, 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 as a great metaphor uh, for the lack of indigenous rights in this country. Um, the fact that most people see a prison and we saw liberation should, should stun people as us being the first people of this country. Um, the fact that they would use this to educate reporters about Indian country, the fact that there's no jobs, there's, there's no mineral resources, no running water, no electricity, right? Um, there, there's no health care on this island. Um, it was a way to be able to dramatize um, this, the conditions of Indian country in the late 1960s and to draw attention to destructive federal policies like relocation and termination. They decided that they were going to construct their own city. They wanted to build a university uh, that would be an all native university. Richard Oakes was really instrumental in, in, in carving out a space to wanna to put a museum um, on this island as well. Um, they wanted a monument. Well, you know, the, the East Coast has the Statue of Liberty. The West Coast should have a monument to indigenous peoples. And that Alcatraz would be that monument to educate people about indigenous rights and indigenous issues. So that people, the first thing they would see when they would come to this country on the West Coast was indigenous land. And so out of this, Richard in this, in this classic photo, um, which is a really rare photo, uh, nobody had ever seen this photo before. It came from uh, the morgues of San Francisco um, in which it never was printed. Um, I had to find this um, and this was found on an auction site in which somebody was auctioning film negatives, uh, photo film negatives, and I instantly bought it. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool uh, because the dates mirrored the Alcatraz occupation. They didn't have any uh, photos of what was on the negatives. I get them and I open them and there's tons of photos of Richard, tons of photos of the occupation. And this just happens to be one of those uh, photos. So that's astonishing. So, but th this act, this act is, um, it's well thought out. I mean, it's, it's got the guerrilla street theater aspects to it. Um, and I'm sure many people thought it was an act of uh, kind of what activist whimsy, but it's not that. And single-handedly it recenters perceptions and claims on indigeneity around the world, doesn't it? Yes, it becomes a, a, an example, a rallying cry, if you will, for indigenous peoples around the world. I mean, um, in Hawaii, even, they will um, uh, take over another island by 1975, um, you know, with the example of Alcatraz or utilizing the example of Alcatraz uh, for native indigenous Hawaiian rights, right? Um, this will become a symbol um, in Australia for the 10 cities uh, that will be erected in 1970s um, in the sense of native liberation for Aboriginal lands in Australia. The Maoris will also point to this for, for new found liberation theologies that are moving throughout New Zealand as Maoris are beginning to claim more and more indigenous lands and titles back uh, through, the, through their treaty rights. Um, so we see this as, as a kind of a globalized effect that Alcatraz has in which indigenous peoples begin to say, yeah, why aren't we standing up for the, or why can't we take over these lands? Why can't we reclaim these lands? How do we overcome colonization? How do we think about decolonization? And what does that mean? Not just for us, but for everyone else, right? Because the symbols of the island were also really provocative. Um, they were using um, not graffiti, because that's a misnomer. The, all the veterans will tell you, no, that's not graffiti. All the, the, the paint that is on the buildings and the signage, that is all political statements. Things that are like home of the free, things that uh, change the shield of justice um, that have bars on it uh, to the word free. Um, you know, uh, the idea that you are on Indian land, um, all these things being visible to reporters that captured the front pages of Time Magazine, that captured the front pages of the New York Times and Washington Post, they channel people into, a, into this idea of what is free Indian space and what does that look like? Um, and so decolonization, what was realized was not just a lesson for indigenous peoples, it was a lesson for the world. And Alcatraz became that ultimate symbol of that spark, if you will, uh, that triggered that movement. 
Exactly. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, we're getting uh, so involved in our conversation. I wanna make sure the audience gets to see these remarkable images. Let's go through these. Uh, Renee, we can go to the next one. And please, everyone, if you have questions, uh, by all means, put them in the chat um, and we'll pick them up. Uh, okay, so this is a stunning photograph. This is probably the most famous photograph um, that occurred on the island. And it was captured by um, a celebrated photographer by the name of Art Kane. Um, and Art Kane um, happened to do a lot of photographs for Look Magazine as well as Life Magazine. He was noted as being primarily a, a, a celebrity photographer took lots of photos of like Jefferson Airplane, tons of musicians, you know, uh, were in his catalog of, of photographs. And of course, um, you can see Richard Oakes right in the front center. Um, next to him, if you go to his left is Annie Oakes, his wife. Uh, to the left of Annie Oakes holding uh, the child uh, is John Trudell and the child is Tara Trudell. Um, if you were to go the opposite direction, uh, you then have Stella Leach, who is another one of the, the main organizers uh, who is on council for Indians of all tribes. Uh, then you have uh, Ray Sprang, um, who is next to, to her. And then, of course, uh, next to them is um, um, uh, Ross Harden, uh, who is Ho-Chunk, uh, who is another one of the original occupiers and veterans. But this is the only known posed photograph that took place on the island. Um, in which uh, literally Arcane got up on a ladder and positioned himself above everyone and called everybody in and somehow took these photos very quickly. And you still have people that were kind of up on the upper decks uh, of the cell blocks looking in. And, and those upper decks are really fascinating. If you go to the third story of the upper deck, they'd given a cell to Joseph Alioto, who is the mayor of San Francisco and wrote Alioto's name on top of it. They put a cell for Ronald Reagan and they put Reagan's name on it, who was the governor of California. And then they had a cell for Nixon, of course, too. Um, kind of prophetically predicting, I guess, Watergate ahead of time. Uh, and then um, uh, they had a cell for PG&E Corporation, which we can talk at greater length about, uh, that uh, was one of the main corporations that had moved on and uh, taken illegally uh, Pitt River lands um, for their multinational uh, corporation, which is headquartered in San Francisco. Um, so they were using this as, as a way to, to, to bring people together. And, and what we see here is, is, is a new form of leadership, a new form of, of native organizing um, that was just gonna catch the world by storm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just quickly before we move to the next photograph, is every occupier indigenous? That's a great question. Um, in fact, a majority were. Um, what we can see is there's a really great uh, book that was just um, opened up to the public and digitized, and it's the Alcatraz Logbook. Um, and it is uh, currently at the Autry Museum, and they digitize it, and you can go online and see this. Um, but the largely the, the populace that stayed at the, the island, if it wasn't, if they weren't journalists, um, they were all native. Um, and they actually, uh, in a humorous way, <laughs> created a Bureau of Caucasian Affairs um, just to mimic the Bureau of Indian Affairs in which um, they literally had to monitor um, anybody who was non-native who was on the island um, as a way to showcase the lack of indigenous rights and kind of how native people are treated by our own federal government. They also staged a mock trial um, on the island, which was really fascinating. Richard Oakes had to play the federal government um, and they literally put the federal government on trial um, and ran this kind of Perry Mason mock trial um, to showcase uh, and, and educate the public about indigenous rights and or issues um, throughout California. Amazing. So highly mobilized, highly yeah. organized. Yeah. All right, Renee, we'll, we're ready for the next image. Thank you. It's a beautiful image. This this one came off of that rare photograph um, find that I had, or those negatives. Um, so this is Annie Oakes, who's on the left. This is Richard Oakes' wife. Um, and these are some of uh, the Oakes' children. Um, and so we have Tanya Oakes that is on the far right. Um, it is thought that that is uh, Leonard Oakes, uh, who is the littlest that's in the front. Um, and then behind Leonard, it's thought that this uh, was actually Yvonne Oakes. Um, or, or possibly William. Uh, but um, I had it confirmed by one of the occupiers that this was indeed a photo of, of Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne um, was 12 at the time. She had her hair cut uh, prior to this because there was, uh, her hair got um, like most kids do, they got um, 
a, a, a form of lice and they needed to cut the hair. Um, and so it was, she was really embarrassed, didn't want a lot of photographs taken after that. Uh, but this one um, was done by a reporter from the San Francisco Examiner. It showcases her holding her brother. And uh, we can go into how I was able to kind of determine um, the identity of, of some of the kids in, in the photos. Uh, but Yvonne would also lose her life in January of, of 1970. She would fall uh, from the third stairwell in the Ira Hayes building, which doesn't exist today. It was an old apartment structure on the island that was torn down after the occupation. Um, she would uh, pass away a few days later, um, even after um, all of San Francisco rallied uh, to her bedside. Um, and it really devastated Richard. It devastated Annie Oaks. And they were, they were looking to actually move their kids off the island before this tragedy happened. Um, and it showcased, too, that we didn't know really what happened either. Um, there's um, as much evidence as I found uh, for her being shoved as others that say uh, that it was a total accident. Um, the, the part and parcel was is that Richard would move off of the island and he made this really famous quote. And one of his most famous quotes is Alcatraz is not an island, it's an idea. That what they were doing on Alcatraz needed to be imported to other places. And this is where I differ from other historians that covered the movement, because most historians tend to landlock Alcatraz to just the island. But Indians of all tribes began doing occupations up and down Northern California. They began going to Seattle and taking over Fort Lawton. Um, they began running occupations on behalf of Pit River nations and peoples. They began going to Clear Lake and LM and other places to uh, lead their support to the takeovers of Rattlesnake Island or the takeovers of Tyon Job Corps Center, which became a part of the Wintu um, headquarters and uh, for the Wintu people. So out of this, it was, as I say, they were going to be meeting mass success and Richard never stopped organizing. He never stopped um, disbelieving in the idea of Alcatraz um, in the sense of basically putting it into practice and into work. Yeah, I think, you know, your book makes this really strong point, which is, um, this is not a stunt. This, this has really far reaching consequences. Can you talk, I, I, I understand the activism and uh, seizure consequences. Can you talk about um, policy consequences or the ways in which the uh, political world responded to this show of activist pride? Yeah, that's a, that's wonderful. Um, I think, um, it, and it gets us into this whole other topic of being able to talk about Nixon too, uh, which Nixon is interesting because he didn't um, activate the federal marshals right away to, to clear uh, people off the island, didn't activate the Coast Guard as well to, to clear people off. Um, in fact, he, he kind of stalemated it. And part of this had to do with um, insiders that worked for Nixon's administration, like Leonard Garment and others under his administration that were trying to say, you know what, um, you know, you really don't have very good relationship with the media right now, um, or with the rest of America due to the anti-war movement. And quite frankly, your record on, on civil rights needs a little bit of help. Uh, so Nixon also had a, a really interesting background. I mean, he had a football coach that came from um, the old um, Haskell and, or I mean, Carlisle days of playing football. And of course, Richard Nixon was kind of like the Rudy of the football team. He was never allowed to play um, other than just being a tackle dummy. Um, but eventually he garnered massive respect for his football coach who was native. Um, and so a lot of people said that Richard Oakes maintained um, this kind of appreciation for Native peoples. He also was competing against the Kennedys, which we could get into that issue even more so uh, in regards to Indigenous rights. But, you know, out of this uh, movement in 1970, one of the first acts um, uh, that Richard Nixon will have in proclaiming himself to be kind of the Indigenous president um, is he will overturn relocation. Um, so he creates a policy statement. He, he overturns relocation in 1970. He overturns termination as a policy of the federal government. He gives Taos Blue Lake back to Taos Pueblo. Um, so he's activating on the activists' um, dreams, essentially, of Native liberation. So we have a president in the White House, a Republican president, that's following suit with an agenda that's being proposed um, by a group of Native students who took over an island, right? Um, so effectively, they, these students were seeing real and positive change come by the way of, of, this, of this movement. 
And yeah. I wonder if the uh, if uh, you know obviously Nixon's in the White House, but I think his Whittier, California Quaker upbringing had something to do with his response to indigenous America, right? Yeah, the Quakers have always had a, kind of a, a, an affiliation, if not an, an alliance with native peoples. Um, you know, that's questionable going to the walking treaties uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, which were a little bit deceptive on the part of the, of the Society for Friends. Uh, but yeah, the Quaker upbringing definitely um, was a component of this. Uh, but, you know, Nixon will also go on to sponsor decisive legislation. Um, out of this time period, this sparks the great upturn in legislation called self-determination legislation, which 29 pieces of self-determination legislation are created, like the Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act, the Tribal College Act, um, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which a lot of people don't realize we didn't get religious freedom in this country until 1978. And that's even with a question mark, right? Because it would go through trials, like um, the Native American church would go through Supreme Court decisions in the 1990s even. Um, but 29 cases of, of, of self-determination legislation would be passed out of this, this, this great um, you know, cycle of, 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 of legislation and, uh, for indigenous rights. Um, but it starts and it's triggered by Richard Nixon administration. Eventually, you know, more Supreme Court decisions would also uh, come out of this as well. So yeah, it's, it, the, the, the story is far more broad than this, but you, in a sense, this is the, a story of two Richards. Um, uh, can you tell us what happens to Richard Oaks? Let's look at one more picture, Renee. We're, 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 we could talk all night, but um, maybe one more picture from Kent's book. Uh, you can narrate that one for us. And then I've got a closing question or two for you, Kent, and then I'd love to hear from people who are with us uh, about questions and comments they have. So is this taken by one of the occupants? Yeah, so this is actually another discovery. So I found slides that somebody had taken from the occupation, and these are color photos, which are really rare uh, to have. Uh, but these, I have to clean the slides up. You can see a little bit of the, the filaments that are still on there, but I, I think it gives a grittiness to its age. Uh, but it's one of the photos of the occupation going down at the time, and it's in color. And the wonderful thing is, is you can see the signage that had been uh, covered over, um, right? The, the political statement, if you will, um, in which they covered it over and wrote Indian land, um, you know, on, on this claiming Alcatraz Island for all native peoples. And so uh, this, this photo, I think, uh, accentuates, you know, uh, one, th this federal prison that's now liberated, this federal prison that has a new dream, this federal prison that has a, a new potential, a new possibility, um, which is to become a cultural center, which is to become a university, uh, a place of education rather than incarceration. Um, it, it really speaks to the, the, the motions uh, that students had at the time, whether it be through the Third World Liberation Front or the Black Panther Party, uh, or you know, uh, the Red Guard in San Francisco to create um, a new space, um, a new space that would be centered around equality, a new space that uh, would, at the same point in time, educate a greater public uh, about equality and inclusion um, in this country. And of course, you know, it gets replicated too. The Brown Berets will take over Catalina Island in 1972, um, rep trying to replicate um, at least what Indians of all tribes had done uh, with the takeover of Alcatraz. And just to go back to Richard Oaks for a second, um, that proclamation has actual policy demands in it, does it not? Yeah, uh, the, the policy demands uh, typically uh, featured, you know, an ending of uh, at least relocation and ending of termination. It was speaking to uh, broader issues of reform and restructure of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It was speaking to um, largely issues of land reform in California. Uh, primarily the Pitt River uh, Nation uh, factored into that um, in the fact that they uh, refused a settlement of 47 cents an acre for their land. Um, and so out of this, it became a, a springboard, if you will, uh, those demands or that proclamation um, for more intensified um, it, it demands of, of, uh, of indigenous rights in this time period. What's your sense, Kent, of the, the non-native let's say Californian, what's your sense of the non-native California understanding and awareness of Alcatraz as this watershed moment in red power? So out of this, I, I'd say that, um, 
you know, there was a tremendous amount of support, um, which, you know, I don't think the students realized they were going to have. I mean, there was, on, on the home front, there was clothing drives that were being um, managed by the diggers in, in San Francisco. There was, there was food being shipped from uh, famous restaurants, uh, particularly they, I think they had six turkeys uh, for Thanksgiving that were sent out to the island. Jane Fonda was giving them uh, generators uh, to be able to have power on the island after the power got cut off. Uh, clear, the band Creedence Clearwater Revival gave them money to buy a boat um, after, you know, to be able to ferry back and forth um, the occupiers and or residents of the island. So just a tremendous outpouring of support. Um, I think people began to pull back that support um, at, a little bit after Yvonne's passing, the media began to kind of turn a little bit more on the occupation. And it was a struggle for Lenata Means. It was a struggle for John Trudell and Stella Leach and a lot of the, the leadership uh, that remained in the council to, to really educate people uh, that this movement was not to go to, to a, 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 a bad spot, but this movement was to uh, continue on moving forward in the same um, ideals and same uh, hopes and aspirations as as, as its origins. So um, yeah, I think uh, the, 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 the surprise of the outpouring of support was, was very generous. I think the uh, students were able to also uh, raise lots of money uh, part and parcel because of celebrities like Buffy St. Marie, uh, who would lend their talents uh, to uh, doing concerts uh, to raise money for the occupation. I think hair even at the time um, which was the big musical that was taking the country by storm, donated several of its shows um, in, in the box office uh, to Alcatraz Island. So it, for the students, it looked like this was going to be a very real possibility. It looked like um, you know, uh, there was legislation that was being sponsored by, um, at that point in time, Jerry Brown um, in the legislature uh, to be able to give Alcatraz Island back uh, to uh, uh, Indians of all tribes. Uh, the hard part about this was is that it should have been a federal decision. So federal government was stepping on the state saying the states didn't have the rights to give back Alcatraz. Um, and so in the, the fervor uh, between state and federal um, entrenchment is where this movement really gets kind of lost. Um, and of course, um, with Nixon kind of holding off on, on moving people off the island, what it also would do is it would allow the media to find other issues, like later Charles Manson, like later, uh, yeah. you know, uh, 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 new issues like Altamont Speedway and the Rolling Stones concert or Vietnam. There was other issues that would begin capturing the news. And as the media moved away from reporting on indigenous issues was where, you know, uh, eventually we have a crackdown on this, on this California dream. And just at the very close here, because I'm cognizant of our time, um, so, uh, two questions. Uh, someone has asked about where they, when they can, where and how can they learn more about relocation? So do you have a text? Obviously your book's gonna address it. Um, so send them to your book. Sure, yeah, no, I, I address it in my book. Um, I actually use Richard Oakes as a, as a lens, like I write his biography, but I look at the development of an Indian city in Brooklyn, um, where he's from, and then uh, he eventually moves to San Francisco. So I do a background on the history of San Francisco, um, it, it largely in the book to showcase uh, this, this environment that he's entering into, this very urban Indian environment. Um, and of course, relocation is a central part of that story. Another really great book though, that I'd also recommend that's a recent book is by a friend of mine, uh, Douglas Miller, uh, which is called Indians on the Move that came out from University of North Carolina Press uh, just uh, I believe last year um, or maybe it was 2019 and um, so uh, Douglas Miller really is looking at uh, the, the, the large breakdown of, of relocation and then of course uh, one of the earliest books that kind of came out on relocation was by um, a, an author Don Fixco an indigenous author and historian out of Arizona State University called Termination and, and Relocation but all three if you have them together um, will be your library for real relocation. That's great. And just finally, Kent, um, I think you sort of addressed this with the declining media attention, the tragic death of Yvonne Oaks. Um, the decision to relinquish occupation is for what reasons? Those reasons and any others? Well, yeah, and by June of 1971 is, is when FBI and federal marshals uh, will wait until there's like a 
very few people. I think there's maybe 15 people that were on the island at the time. Uh, there was far more residents than that. So, uh, but they waited till there was literally only 15 people and they barricade the island. Um, they take people off. Um, and, of, and of course, in these arrests, the reporters ensue and Alcatraz is back in the papers. Um, the remnants though, is that they couldn't get back to the island. Um, a lot of scholars would write, well, you know, Indians of all tribes, they didn't succeed. We didn't get the island. We didn't get the university, you know, so it was a failure. And what I try to do in the book is, is write it from a different perspective in that it was a success story. Um, and the reason being I, that I call it a success is, is has to do with my own awakening moment. Um, and my big moment, and I think the aha moment of my research um, is when I went to San Francisco as a young graduate student um, from the University of New Mexico, and I decided to take a ferry boat out for the first time uh, to go to the island. And I'd seen all the photographs. I'd studied this, the photographs endlessly, and I'd seen a lot of the political statements on the buildings. And, you know, it, it registered with me a little bit, you know, of like the importance of that. Um, but it wasn't until I got on the boat and we're heading out. And of course, I go to the front of the boat because I want to see, you know, the superstructure of the Golden Gate Bridge. I want to feel the sea spray. I want to see where Richard Oaks would have jumped off. So I'm like that big nerd guy who's just eating it up. <laughs> it is like all about the Indian occupation. I notice, you know, people behind me, they're talking about, oh, I can't wait to see Machine Gun Kelly and now Capone. And they're talking about all the criminals, right, you know, of, of, of this occupation. Um, or what were the toughest criminals? And I laughed to myself because I'm like, ironically, I'm going out to see the America's toughest Indians, you know, on this island. And so it's this totally different engaged experience for me um, than a lot of the audience on the ferry boat. And that boat pulls around on the island and it comes up to the dock, which is on the other side. And there's this giant sign that says Indians welcome. And I remember seeing that. And I had like chills and goosebumps go up and down my spine because I realized as a native person, this was the first welcome sign in my own home country, my own homelands I had ever seen. And, and it hit me like a baseball bat, the importance of this occupation, that this occupation was incredibly successful because it's still speaking to people today. It's still educating people. It reached me as a young man in the 1990s about the importance of this and significance of it. And the feeling of, am I really truly free? Am I truly liberated when this is the first welcome sign I'm seeing on a former federal prison? And of course, when you get off the island, still to this day, the National Park makes you gather under that sign. And they explain to people um, the, that there was an occupation that changed indigenous rights forever. And today it's the most populous, second most populated urban park to that of the Statue of Liberty. In other words, over 5 million people a year go to Alcatraz Island, and they have a chance to learn about this amazing occupation that changed indigenous rights around the world forever. And I'd say this was probably one of the most successful occupations and or uh, movements in the 1960s, and something that really um, is, is, is amazing um, in regards to uh, every time I go out there, I just get chills, um, even to this day. And I had the chance to go to the 50th anniversary um, in 2019 uh, for uh, the Alcatraz Island and just to be around my heroes uh, and to see people um, that, you know, really gave up everything and sacrificed everything because they didn't know um, if they were going to be arrested. They didn't know if they were going to have long term jail sentences, be charged with felonies. They literally put everything on the island. They didn't know if they were going to die on that island. I mean, they literally risked it all uh, for this next generation. And the rights that I have as an indigenous person today wouldn't be possible if they didn't take those risks. So it's with that, that you know, we, we really got to give them their due honor um, in the sense of being veterans of this movement. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that very personal reflection. It really is very meaningful and, um, and telling. So uh, I, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. Um, Kent, I want to congratulate you on a wonderful book. And you bring so much knowledge and passion to the topic that we're all the beneficiaries of your uh, intellect and your work. So congratulations. Thank you to a, a very large crowd out there. Thank you for the questions. I apologize we couldn't get to all of them, um, but I urge you to follow up with uh, Kent's work. Uh, and if you see the survey, please take the survey from Kirsten Vega there on the, um, on the chat. And um, I just want to wish everyone a very, very uh, good evening and a uh, good day tomorrow and have a great 
uh, weekend and uh, everyone be healthy. And thanks again to California Humanities. Good night. <laughs>